Let's join Dr. Margot Savoy for a discussion on endocrine diseases. So we're going to do all of endocrine diseases minus diabetes, which I think you did this morning already, um, in the next 30 minutes. I still don't have anything to disclose. What we're going to do is talk specifically about the thyroid, um, talk about pituitary masses and male hypogonadism kind of quickly. And then we do have some additional slides on adrenal problems and parathyroid problems sort of at the end in case you wanted to review that for yourself. And then the um, adenoma whole, there's a whole, I think it's 30 minutes actually about adenomas if you want to um, check that out. So 17-year-old female complains of swelling in her neck times two to three weeks, a five-pound weight gain and somewhat tired. Um, her view systems was negative. Um, you see her vital signs. She's got, she's 5'10", 155 pounds, blood pressure 132 over 80. She's got a pulse of 80. Um, so you find that she's got a, th a thyroid that's diffusely enlarged. It's smooth. It's non-tender. But the rest of her exam is pretty normal. So what initial test do you want to get to work her up? Do you want to get a T4, an RT3U, a TSH, or an ultrasound? Fantastic. So most of you pick C, TSH. TSH, TSH is the right answer. This is one where people sometimes trip themselves up on the exam because they try to get fancy. And they're like, I don't know what an RT3U is, so that must be the right answer because I don't know what it is. No, it's a TSH, because that's what you would have ordered in the office. It's the same thing. Now, granted, you probably would have ordered with a reflex T4 and all the fancy stuff, but don't stress yourself out about it. Literally go with what you know. Like, do not try to over-psych yourself out for this exam. So hypothyroidism is where we're going to start. So remember that females are more likely than males, so 6 to 1. But it does happen quite frequently, so 1 in 300 people. Um, there are a lot of causes. Hashimoto's is the one that drives me nuts because it shows up in hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. And I just think it's ridiculous that you can have the same thing showing up in both places. But we'll talk about Hashimoto's a little bit later and why it shows up in both. But remember, you can also cause it. It can be caused from an ablation from when you had your hyperthyroidism. Medications can cause it. Um, so I usually circle the amiodarone because for some reason that one seems to show up a lot on exams. So the patient has some other thing going on. They're on amiodarone. Oh, by the way, now their thyroid seems, at, seems to be abnormal or they're having symptoms of thyroid disease. And it turns out it's because of the amiodarone. Um, we do have a fairly decent number of people on lithium these days again, and so that's worth paying attention to in real life because it actually does come up in the office. And then there could be some other transient and central causes. This is a slide that I would put a big star on because if I were going to write a question and try to give you a person who was having hypothyroidism, these are the descriptors that I would probably throw into the, the little header part of the question to figure it out. So things like they've been having some weight gain, they're concentrating a little differently, they've got coarse hair and the goiter. I might throw on there there's some fatigue because everybody's got a little bit of fatigue and some dry skin, that sort of a thing. So this is one that I would pay attention to just because these are the sort of symptoms that would easily make up a good question. Doing your diagnosis, you're going to start with the history and the physical exam. I can't say that enough times. If you get that as a choice, history and physical exam is almost always the right answer. If you're going to do blood work, you're going to start off with the TSH. And then, if needed, you would proceed to do things like thyroid antibodies. And you might get surrogate markers, but honestly, like, that's not something that I would spend a lot of time on because they don't have a lot of great evidence about which one you would do next. So if you were following an algorithm, it wouldn't necessarily tell you that this is the sort A that you would do X, Y, and Z. And so what they do have evidence on is the TSH. And so that's the one that I would focus my energy on if I were taking an exam. So six weeks after initiating therapy with levothyroxine, you check a steady state level of the TSH. The TSH is only decreased from 9.3 to 7.21. All of the following factors are barriers to reaching a therapeutic goal except A, use of desiccated thyroid supplementation, B, treating with T4 rather than T3, C, the patient is also taking lithium, or D, you noted that the patient has a selenium deficiency. So this one, we got a little bit of a mixed response. So the right answer was B, treating with T4 rather than T3. Some of you, I don't, where are you checking this selenium at? Like, y'all have a selenium lab at your place? Like, don't get fooled by people asking you crazy questions. We know that you ain't checking no selenium level. And so that is not the right answer. <laughs> Do not let them trick you. All right, let's keep going. So initiating treatment. You're going to start at 1.6 micrograms per kilogram per day. You might start a little bit less if they're elderly, so you may do a little bit lower dose. You're going to reevaluate them in five to six weeks, see how they're doing, or if you change the dose. So if you change the dose, even if they're feeling better, you might choose to redo the lab just to make sure that you didn't overshoot and you were doing okay. Different products do have different bioavailability, and remember, there's always going to be that one person in your practice who transferred from somebody down the street who's still taking Armour Thyroid, and you have no idea what that is because they didn't have that in your residency, and now they're like, what am I supposed to do? And you're 
you're like, I don't know, stop taking that and take something else. Um, so just know that some things do have different bioavailability and they might actually feel better on it, but we don't necessarily know how to move it from place to place or whether med from one version to the next version is exactly the same because the way it's created is a little bit different. So it's not as standard as your sort of routine dose of whatever um, version of the generic levothyroxine you're given. So just keep that in the back of your mind. It is also true that some versions of levothyroxine that are not the quote unquote branded ones may vary. So if you start me out on brand blue and then you switch me to brand green, I might actually have a symptom that feels different even though I'm on the exact same dose because the way they made my new generic version might not work with me the same way it did before. So when your patient comes in and says they really do need to have the brand name, a fill in the blank, whatever, they may actually be telling you the truth when it comes to thyroid medicine. So just be aware of that just as a home thing. So some treatment principles in general, we just sort of avoid desiccated thyroid. We avoid giving people T3. If they're supra-therapeutic, they probably really love you because they lost a lot of weight and they have more energy than they've ever had before. And yet we don't want to do that. We can make them have osteoporosis and AFib. And so you do want to back off the dose if you're sort of supra-therapeutic. Um, we do recommend them taking on a fasting stomach and waiting 30 minutes before they eat. This has become a big deal for me because I find that I'm telling my, especially my older women patients, I'm telling them that I need them to take their thyroid on an empty stomach, their PPI on an empty stomach, and also their osteoporosis meds on an empty stomach. And they were like, well, it would take me three hours before I'm actually able to eat breakfast in the morning, so when am I supposed to take my insulin? And I realized that that actually is a valid concern. And so you may want to give some thought to when you're having people taking what medicine and on which days and how you want them to do it. And then do keep in mind that if they're not taking it on a fasting stomach, what they think they're absorbing may not be what they're absorbing. So you might have been jacking up their dose for the last few months thinking that it's wrong. Then all of a sudden they start taking it on a fasting stomach and it starts to work a lot better because they're absorbing more. And so that by itself could be a reason for a change in their level, even without changing the dose of meds. And it can interact with other things that people may be taking that they forget to tell you about, things like iron and antacids, um, if they're drinking grapefruit juice, and then sort of other meds that we might have prescribed. So things like sulcrophate, which like blocks um, the, the lining of your stomach, so things for like ulcers, or if we have them on the amiodarone, on the lithium or SSRIs. Um, if their TSH is normal, so that you actually do the lab work and the lab work comes back normal, but they're still not feeling well, you might actually choose to continue to treat them. So this is one of those times where you're treating the patient and not treating the lab number that you're looking at. So if they're still not feeling right, their symptoms didn't go all the way away, you may have to treat them a little bit more. And it may be that they're a person who doesn't convert their T4 to T3 as well, so they need a slightly higher dose to get to the level that you're assuming that they're getting to with the dose you're giving. And then you can have some exposures and nutrient deficiencies that can cause issues, but the truth of the matter is that most of the time you're not going to be doing some selenium test or some heavy metal lab tests and things like that. That would be a rare, um, a rare exception. So this is one that I would put a star on because this is the kind of list that would be a really easy question to ask you. The person happens to be on one of these meds and their TSH doesn't seem to be getting better the way you thought it would and how come they're not feeling better? And it's because they, decrease their, they have a decreased ability to convert their T4 to T3. So these are pretty common meds, right? So OCPs, SSRIs. I have a whole lot of patients that are just on those two alone. If I throw in the opiates, that's like everybody. And so like at the end of the day, you have a lot of people who might be taking meds that might get in the way. And so I'm just throwing it out there. You're like, this may be a good time to back off of that Percocet because, you know, it's decreasing your T4 to T3 conversion. So just throw it out there. There's a lot of choices. So this is important in case you have a person who doesn't seem like they're getting better on a dose that you thought they should. You may want to look at the other meds that are on their med list and see if it's causing a problem. There are other factors that may cause it that are not medication. This is another slide that I would put a star on because this would be a really easy thing to put into a question. Things like stress and aging and alcohol. So if you're doing alcohol and you're taking your pain meds and you're on your SSRI, you may really be having a hard time getting your thyroid stuff together. And while we're all worried about maybe you're, you're just hypothyroid, maybe it's truly that we're blocking a lot of what the med was trying to do with the other things that you're taking. But then also things like um, having receptor antibodies, pesticides, and then smoking cigarettes can also cause a problem. And so this is yet another reason in the list, a very, very long list of reasons why you should quit smoking. Next question, a 42-year-old male complains of fatigue, weight loss, a voracious appetite, a hand tremor, headaches, and worsening anxiety symptoms for the last four weeks. He's six foot tall, 150 pounds. His thyroid is diffusely large. It's not tender. He does have a fine hand tremor. You do a TSH, it's suppressed at 0.12, and his T4 is elevated. What would be your next diagnostic step? So are you getting a CBC? a radio iodine uptake study, thyroid antibodies, or an ultrasound. Good job. So you're a little bit tied in the middle. So there's like half of you that were going for the radio iodine uptake study. Answer B. That's the right answer. Some of you were going for some thyroid antibodies. I'm not going to be totally mad at you. We're talking about hyperthyroidism. So hyperthyroidism, female to male, is 8 to 1. So notice that both of the, th the, both of the thyroid diseases are more likely to happen in women and men. 
Hypo was six to one, hyper is eight to one. The US prevalence is a little bit less of the hyperthyroidism than it is of hypothyroidism, though at only 0.2%. The causes tend to be things like Graves' disease, multinodular coiter, adenomas. You can have a thyroiditis. The reason that we bolded um, the Graves' disease is because most of the time in life and on the exam, the answer is usually Graves' disease. And so that's the reason why we put it in bold. That's the one that I would pay the most attention to if I wanted to really think it through. Presentation, this is one that I would put a star on because this is the sort of stuff that I would put in to my question stem if I was trying to figure out how to describe the patient to you with hyperthyroidism. I'd tell you that they were nervous and they had palpitations, they had this tremor, they were really tired, they couldn't sleep. Some people will have an increased appetite but still have weight loss, which is a problem I wish I had, but I don't. Um, they may have mental changes, they may get dyspneic on exertion, or they may just be really irritable, so they just don't feel like themselves. It's almost like they feel like they're jumping out of their skin. So some of the patients who you're treating right now for anxiety may actually be having thyroid issues, which is one of the reasons why they talk about thinking about their thyroid when they come in. Your workup is gonna look not that different than your workup for hypothyroidism. You're still starting with the TSH. So when we're talking about the thyroid on this exam, your first test, your first test, your first test is always the TSH. Start with the TSH. If you were gonna pick a test to start, you would pick the TSH, okay? So TSH. Your next level is gonna be things like the free T4, free T3. You may do a radioactive iodine uptake scan. That's an A, which is the reason why um, we picked that as the answer for the question, because it's actually a sort level A. Um, and then you can do all the other things necessary um, if you needed to. The CBC is a B, because look, you're looking for the associated anemia, but it's not necessarily gonna change what you're doing at the moment. Really what you're doing is looking to see if they're tired because they're anemic too. But really you'd wanna know more about whether or not their thyroid was going on for what you're trying to manage. And so it's a B, because it may be concurrent, but it's not necessarily gonna change what you're doing at that moment if they've got thyroid disease. Um, Graves' disease is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism. It's caused by TSH receptor-stimulating antibodies. Um, there are other causes of hyperthyroidism. So Hashimoto's, I double start because it shows up here and there, and there's in inevitably a question that goes, you said it was this one, but now it's that one. So the problem with Hashimoto's disease is that people tend to burn out. So you start out with this raging, inflamed thyroiditis, and then you burn yourself out. So depending on when you catch the person in the spectrum of their disease, they could either be hypothyroidism or they could be hyperthyroidism. So whenever I have something that's that confusing, I usually don't assume that they're gonna to try to make me a multiple choice question on it. Um, or if they do, it's gonna be so blatantly obvious because of all the other things that they describe that it's gonna make a lot of sense. Because truthfully, the person could present to your office in either way, and it could be the right answer. But it is good for you to have in the back of your head. Because if you have a patient who really looked like they were hyperthyroid and then over time, you haven't really done anything yet and all of a sudden they're hypothyroided, it may be that they had something like a thyroiditis that burned itself out, in which case you have a whole different pathway and treatment and things like that. So that's the reason why it shows up on both slides. And notice that amiodarone shows up on this slide also. So amiodarone is one that I just sort of pay attention to because it's just one of those annoying meds. It works really well when it works really well, but it causes a lot of weird side effects. And so just keep that one in the back of your head. This is a slide that I would put a star on because it goes through um, pretty cleanly um, what they think about when they're thinking about how you would order it. So if you're thinking about hyperthyroidism, the TSH is low, the T4 is high, you're gonna order the scan as your next step. Then depending on what the scan shows, tells you where you're gonna go next. So if it's a diffuse uptake, they're trying to tell you that they've got Graves' disease. If they tell you that there's a nodule, they're trying to tell you there's an adenoma. And if they tell you that they see multiple nodules, they're trying to tell you it's multiple nodule goiter. So that's really where they're trying to go if they're asking you that question. So this is one that I would put a star on. Your treatment is gonna be radioactive iodine. That's something I would circle, because that is a level A evidence. Um, the one time that it may be different um, is if the person has eye symptoms, then you might actually not use radioactive iodine as your first choice, that's a B recommendation. I'm telling you that because I know it to be a true fact, but I also know that that's really, really, really detailed. And the chances that that's gonna be the one question they choose to ask you out of all of the thyroid things they could ask you is probably really low. But just be aware of that in the back of your mind. Surgery used to be common, it's not so common today anymore. And the medications that we tend to use are PTU or methimazole and then beta blockers for the symptoms. There is some inconclusive evidence that there are some Chinese um, herbal medicines that might work, but they've not been able to prove that they actually worked. Although some people find them, um, they feel like they feel better on them, we can't prove it. So that would not be the choice on the exam. In general, they consider methimazole to be safer than PTU. So if I had to pick between the two on the exam, I would pick methimazole, um, mostly because they're worried about liver injury with PTU. So PTU is generally considered the second line agent. So if they asked me what was the first line agent, I would pick methimazole. The only exception to that, which will come up again for you in the pregnancy talk, is if they're pregnant. So if they're in their first trimester or, or if they're lactating, then you actually would use PTU as your first choice, not methimazole. So methimazole for everybody except the pregnant women and the lactating women, and then it's PTU. And so that's one I would put a star on because it just seems like a really easy one 
that I would get wrong on the test and then I would be mad and then I'd be like, right, the one exception. 46-year-old female comes in with a painless neck mass for the last six weeks. Review of systems negative, physical exam is normal, except that she does have this palpable two centimeter firm mass in the right lobe of her thyroid. What is the initial diagnostic test? Do you want a TSH, a fine needle aspiration, a free T4, or a thyroid ultrasound? So 59% of you said TSH. Now, I don't know what the rest of y'all were doing. What part of TSH, 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 order the TSH first? Did you not hear me say TSH? T? Okay, I'm not going to spell all the way out. No, seriously, order the TSH first. So th even for thyroid nodules, you're going to get the TSH first. Um, only 5% of them are going to turn out to be mal malignant. A lot of them are going to just turn out to be solitary, hyperplastic ones that you're not going to really do a whole lot with. But you still start with the TSH. It's a sort level A, and so it's, it's, it's still going to show up on the exam because it's still a sort level A. So even if you want to fight me about it later, it's okay, but it's still going to be TSH. And then depending on what the TSH shows, then you'll determine what you're going to do next, like one way or the other. Um, if they're benign, they're going to think about like adenomas and cysts. You can have Hashimoto's, which can also sort of fall into this group. Or you can get a subacute thyroiditis. You can also have malignant ones. If they're malignant, they tend to be these papillary carcinomas. I wouldn't spend too much time stressing about them, but if somebody asked me the most common ones, we put them in bold so that you could find that really easy on the slide. This is one that I would put a big star on um, because this is all in one slide of the workup for a thyroid nodule. So what you would do if you found a thyroid nodule, you notice in the big box at the top, it starts with something that I might have told you already. You start with the TSH. And then after that, you decide to get an ultrasound. And then you either, depending on whether the TSH is high or low, go on to get either the, um, iodine scan, I, um, the radioactive iodine scan or a fine needle aspiration. And then you figure out kind of where to send them from there. So this is a slide that I would put a star on because it really cleanly puts in one spot sort of the workup and where you would go next in your steps. There are other causes of hyperthyroidism. So Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which we talked about a little bit, that's the one that's the lymphocytic thyroiditis. It's usually a painless, non-tender, diffuse goiter. They can get some pain. It's possible, but typically, the person's going to say that it's painless. Um, mostly, they just have this big pressure, and they feel like they can't swallow well, and they may have a fever, and then they have elevated inflammatory markers. You could also have a subacute thyroiditis show up. This one tends to be more a viral picture, so the person's got like a viral illness, and then, oh, by the way, their thyroid gets inflamed, and they end up having this sort of symptom on the other side. Um, initially, these people also start off with this hyperthyroidism picture and then transiently become hypothyroid because they literally overuse their thyroid to burn it out. And so similar to what we were describing about the Hashimoto's. Um, and so your clinical diagnosis with this one would also be a thyroid function test, which is still a TSH. TSH. The answer is TSH. So if you have a pregnant patient, um, sometimes they can have thyroid problems and not actually have anything wrong. It's just the fact that, for example, um, they're pregnant. So your thyroid itself can actually get bigger during your pregnancy, and that can change sometimes what your medication looks like. If you started off hypothyroid before you were pregnant, it can also change um, the actual hormones when you're drawing their blood work. And so if you were to test women who were pregnant in their first trimester, 10% of them will show up positive for some of the antibodies, even though they don't necessarily have thyroid disease at the time. And so be mindful of the fact that if the woman is pregnant, you may be getting pictures that may need to be reevaluated after their pregnancy is done to make sure that what you thought you were diagnosing is really what you were diagnosing. And so it's just more a red flag. I don't know that that necessarily will show up um, on the exam in that particular way, but it is worth noting because I've had that happen, at least to me in the office, more than once. If you have a woman who has hypothyroidism and you're treating her, her goal is to keep the TSH below three during her pregnancy. Um, you would actually, and this is one that I would put a circle on because it's one that I don't think about all that often. Most of the time when we talk about subclinical hypothyroidism, we make a big deal about how you don't treat them. Like you're treating the symptoms, you're not treating the number. That's one of those big speeches that everybody gives you. The one exception to that is when they're pregnant. So if you have a pregnant woman who has subclinical hypothyroidism, and they've got positive antibodies, you go ahead and treat them anyway. And so they're ones that you wouldn't just watch them and wait to see if it gets better. You wouldn't wait for them to develop symptoms. You would go ahead and treat them during the pregnancy, and then you retest it later and figure out one way or the other. If for some reason you decide to not treat them, you would recheck every four weeks, and then you continue to recheck into their, um, further into their pregnancy to make sure that nothing is getting worse. But the recommendation is actually to treat the hypothyroidism. There is not a treatment needed if they have isolated low T4. So if it's just the T4 that's low, you don't do anything with that. If they're already on levothyroxine, so I come to you, I'm hypothyroid, I'm now pregnant, you are likely going to need to increase the dose of my um, Synthroid dose 
during the time of my pregnancy, usually the dose has to increase somewhere between 25 and 50 percent, depends on the woman. And so what you're going to want to do is be paying attention to her dose, um, be paying attention to her dose, and paying attention to her TSH, TSH level, so that you can adjust for her how much you think. Um, I know in our area, people tend to just go ahead and increase it by 25 percent at the time they find you're pregnant, and then they recheck it later to see whether or not it gets worse and whether they need a higher or lesser dose, because they almost always assume that you're going to need some more. They just don't want to necessarily overshoot it and start with the 50 percent, if that makes sense. But there's not a set guideline that says you have to do it this exact way. Antithyroid meds are not indicated for people with gestational hyperthyroidism, so we are not throwing radioactive iodine at pregnant women. Do not do that. It's bad. Um, and for Graves' disease, you use PTU in the first trimester, and then you use methimazole later in the pregnancy. A 58-year-old male was noted to have an elevated calcium level on routine lab work. His PMH is significant for hypertension. He denies any complaints. His exam is unremarkable. He's got labs that show a calcium of 12.3, FOS of 2.3, Magnesium of 113, a chloride of 101, outfoss of 88, a PTH, that is normal. Um, you suspect that he has hyperparathyroidism. All of the following are common symptoms of hyperparathyroidism except bone pain, increased appetite, depression, or renal stones. So most of you picked B, increased appetite, and that's the right answer. So causes of hypercalcemia is one that I would put a star on because this one seemed to come up for some reason in the last couple years um, for hypercalcemia in general. Um, mostly they're thinking about parathyroid hormone related, and so there's a lot of, um, a lot of sort of push towards thinking about at least hy hyperparathyroidism. I think the reason that they're talking about it more is because of the increased number of people with chronic renal disease and the increased the number of people who are sort of having, um, having hyperparathyroidism, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. It is associated with both vitamin D deficiency and chronic renal failure, and so that's one that I would sort of pay attention to. If you have a patient who you've started on vitamin D, so we have a lot of patients who are now taking either over-the-counter vitamin D or you've given them vitamin D in the office because they were low, vitamin D intoxication can also cause you to have hypercalcemia. So if they're taking some insane dose or they're taking it when they don't really need to be taking it, so now they're at a super therapeutic level, they could also have high calcium levels. And then the other ones that you want to pay a lot of attention to are things like malignancy. So I may have a high calcium level because I'm leaching all the calcium from my bones, from the tumor that's in my bone, um, and so you want to pay attention to that. Um, remember, medications can also cause hypercalcemia. This is one that I always put a star by because I get it confused every time I try to think about it. Th thiazide diuretics are ones that confuse people. They actually cause you to have a hypercalcemia. And then everybody gets all worked up and they're like, but well, what about that whole kidney stone thing? So the, the trick about thiazide diuretics is that you can actually use them to prevent people from getting calcium stones because they make you have hypercalcemia. If I put all the calcium back into your blood, it's not in your urine. And if it's not in your urine, then it can't make a stone. So then you don't get a kidney stone, but now it's back in your blood. And so a thiazide diuretic can cause hypercalcemia and you can use it to treat calcium stones that's why they, they talk about them when it comes up on slides all the time. I don't spend a lot of time stressing about it because it confuses so many people. I've never actually seen it show up on the exam quite that way, but I tell you that because it seems to be one that really gets people all the time. So the reason why you can use a thiazide diuretic to treat your kidney stones is because it puts the calcium back in your blood so it's not in your urine to make a stone. Does that make sense? Um, other things that can do that, lithium, vitamin A, there's lots of endocrine disorders that can cause hypercalcemia. Um, you can also have um, things like just not moving around, or um, if you have a person who's like bedridden, so sometimes in nursing homes where people can't actually get up and move around as much, they can have a hypercalcemia from just being immobilized. And then if you had a person who had rhabdo, in their recovery phase as they're trying to heal, they can also get a hypercalcemia. Hyperparathyroidism people usually come in with bone pain, depression, the urination. Remember, this is that whole bone, stone, psychic, groans, psychiatric overtone, something, something or another from med school. You remember that? That's them. So hyperparathyroid people think hypercalcemia. And remember, hypercalcemia were the bones and the groans and the other people. So those all go together. You want to locate and remove the tumor surgically is really the treatment. So that's the idea. So you find the tumor and take it out. Parathyroidism, you can have hypoparathyroidism or hyperparathyroidism. These are not um, really as common, and oft honestly, they don't really come up on the, on the exam as often, but we felt like since we were talking about parathyroidism, and we just thought we should talk about it and just throw it out there for you, but honestly, we don't think this is one that seems to come up very often. It's, it's, um, it's not quite as often shown up. Um, hyperparathyroidism usually is a benign adenoma, so we do talk about this a little bit more in the adenoma talk. Um, usually, the people don't really have a whole lot of symptoms at the time. You find it, you take it out. And so that's pretty much the treatment. You can have a secondary one. If you're vitamin D deficient, you can look like you have hyperparathyroidism, which is why sometimes the people with um, 
the people with renal disease will look like they have hyperparathyroidism and then you treat their vitamin D level and all of a sudden they get better. That's the, that's the reason why. Um, but I, honestly, you try to treat the underlying cause for the secondary people and the primary people, you just take the tumor out. A 33-year-old comes in with irregular menses and galacteria for the last three months. The remainder of her past medical um, history and physical exam are unremarkable. Her lab studies are normal except for a prolactin level of 310. The most appropriate next step in her workup is A, a dexamethasone suppression test, B, a PET scan of her brain, C, an MRI of her brain, or D, a CAT scan with and without contrast. Awesome, so most of you picked a C, an MRI of her brain, and that is the right answer. So we're talking about a prolactinoma. Um, so when you're thinking about prolactinoma, the, the amount of prolactin level typically goes with the tumor size. So the bigger the size of the tumor, the more the prolactin level tends to be. But if you get, a, so they, this is the one where if you get a level and they tell you that it's over 200, it's almost always a prolactinoma. If you get a level and it's less than 25, it's almost always normal, even if it seems like it's a little bit high based on the lab range. So less than 25, they're probably normal. Greater than 200, it's all, almost always a prolactinoma. Somewhere in the middle, you got some work to do, but that's probably not gonna be on the exam, so we're not gonna talk about it now. You're gonna get a pregnancy test to make sure that that's not the reason why. TA, a thyroid study test normally comes up. MRI with contrast or a CAT scan with coronal cuts, but the MRI is actually the preferred choice. Um, and sometimes they'll have you do um, regular vision testing, but really the right answer is that you're supposed to send them for formal visual field exams so that you make sure that they truly don't have a loss of their peripheral vision. Um, and then you wanna make sure that the rest of their pituitary is still functioning. Remember we told you that there's a whole thing about adenomas. Adenomas are all these pituitary abnormalities. So that's the whole thing that has its whole other lecture someplace else that you can go and listen to. Um, and it goes into detail about all of these, but honestly, the way that I think about it, whatever it is that you're making too much of is what it is that you're gonna have a symptom of. So if I'm making too much prolactin, I'm gonna have a whole lot of galacteria. It's really that straightforward, but the adenoma thing goes through the whole thing. So whatever it is that's overproducing, that's what it is that my symptoms are gonna look like. Um, so if you're trying to work up a cellar mass in general, you're doing the MRI with or without the gadolinium. The CAT scan and the PET scan are sort of your second choices, um, but they're on the list of things that you could get. The differential are things like benign tumors versus malignant tumors. Most of them are going to be benign pituitary adenomas. That's the most common mass that you pick up on the exam, but you could have a whole bunch of other things that are going on. This is one that I would put a baby star by, because if I had to go through a differential diagnosis and sort of think through what else it might be, I would pay attention to it, but I don't know that I would spend a whole lot of time researching great detail all the, you know, exactly how you figure out about a germ cell tumor. Cushing syndrome is one to pay attention to. This is one that I would put a big star on because I would come back and look at it. I'm not gonna read you all of the different details of it because I think it's one that's easier for you to just read on your own. But just don't forget that Cushing's disease exists. It's actually a really easy one to ask a question about. Mostly what you wanna do is be thinking about cortisol level being too high. This is the one that has the dexamethasone suppression test. So I'd put a star on this because this is one that people wanna come back to and think about. When people try to explain it in front of a large room, everybody gets really confused. So this is one that I would go home and look at myself. This slide makes it a lot more straightforward. Normal is that the pituitary makes less ACTH and then the adrenals make less cortisol. If I give you dexamethasone, I make you make less ACTH. So in theory, you should be making less cortisol, but you're still making it, therefore it's positive. And so that's how you tell the difference if a person has Cushing's disease or not. I know that me saying that to you right now is going nee, 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 and so it doesn't really matter. So put a star on it and dog ear the page and then later when you're ready to think about it and your brain's not tired, go back and look at this page and it will make a lot of sense because it's really, really straightforward. It just feels confusing because that's the way it felt in med school. Addison's disease, you're also thinking decreased cortisol but also decreased aldosterone. So this is another one I would put a star on because it's an easy one to ask questions about but it's also one of those ones where you just have to read through the list about how they present and what they look like. Most of the time this is an inadequate secretion of ACTH from the pituitary gland so it's in that adenoma type group um, but you get that clinical presentation of, um, of folks having a lot of sort of symptoms. So pay attention to Addison's. The diagnostic testing for this one is gonna be the serum electrolytes, the blood glucose, and the CBC. But once you get through that initial stuff, this is the one that has the ACTH stim test, which we're not gonna go into detail about, but I'm just telling you that. So that's why I would put the baby star on this one if I wanted to come back and look at it again later, but I wouldn't stress myself about it. And the treatment is just giving it back. So you're low, so we give it back. We have a slide that summarizes all those things for you, um, just because it's helpful to have it, and then reminding you that there are supplementary slides later. And that's it. Thank you very much, Dr. Savoy.